Forget Venice, there's a far bigger city that's sinking a hell of a lot faster. This is Jakarta, home to 11 million people. It's a bustling megacity with some of the world's tallest buildings and a very rich history. It's also the economic, cultural and political centre of Indonesia, a country of more than 280 million spread over 17,000 islands. To say it's a vital artery of the region would be a major understatement. Jakarta is the largest city in Southeast Asia, but it's sinking at a rate of up to 15 centimeters a year, and in some areas that rate's actually 26 centimeters. In comparison, Venice is only sinking by 1 to 2 millimeters a year. Estimates show that at least 40% of Jakarta is currently below sea level and that it will be largely underwater by 2050. But this is a B1M video, so you just know there's going to be a wild engineering solution coming, and it's this. They're planning to build a 32km seawall here along Jakarta Bay. This, alongside 17 artificial islands, includes an enormous section designed to look like a mythical bird, a symbol of the country. Oh, and while the government begins work on this outlandish plan, they're also doing something else. Moving. The Indonesian government is building an entirely new capital city in the middle of the jungle, miles away from the flooding metropolis. This is the wild story of the race to save and flee Jakarta. It's like something from a science fiction movie, an enormous megastructure designed to withhold a biblical flood. But before we tell you how it's being built, we need to turn back the clock and show you why. This is where Jakarta is, on a low-lying coastal plain at the mouth of 13 rivers. This here is the Siliwang River, and it's the most important one. The area is naturally swampy, and during wet season it receives heavy monsoon rainfall. These conditions have, throughout time, made it vulnerable to flooding. The Dutch established what was then Batavia in the early 17th century, and as the Dutch tend to do, they tried to model it after Amsterdam, building canals everywhere, using them both for transportation and drainage. But poor maintenance and a lack of understanding of the tropical climate led to stagnation, mosquito-borne diseases, and, you guessed it, flooding. Many of these Dutch canals remain to this day, but they were not built for 11 million people. When Indonesia gained independence in 1945, the population of Jakarta exploded. There were waves of migration from rural areas, and the city expanded without any kind of typical urban planning. Informal settlements were developed along riverbanks, reducing and narrowing the width of waterways, and increasing runoff. The floods only got worse thanks to this loss of green space and natural floodplains, as well as poor waste management that clogged drains and rivers, and land subsidence due to groundwater extraction. Now, that last one is important, and perhaps the greatest reason behind why this city is sinking so quickly. You see, in order to meet the water needs of more than 11 million people, water is pumped from underground aquifers. This extraction has caused the land above the aquifers to sink, and this method has been used extensively due to the limited availability of piped water, especially in the city's slums and poorer areas. Now, this isn't brand new information for Indonesia. In fact, the government has tried to crack down on water extraction for years. They've introduced a number of regulations and mandatory permits, alongside an extensive public awareness campaign to try and show people the dangers of such practices. But on the ground, the enforcement of these laws can be difficult, and those extracting water this way often go unpunished. It may sound like the city is literally digging its own hole, but what has to be remembered is that this is happening in extremely poor areas that often lack proper infrastructure. The Corruption Eradication Commission discovered at least 10,000 illegal wells during a survey of the capital a few years ago, and that number has only increased since then. So what can be done? Well, many have proposed what seems to be the obvious solution. Jakarta should refill these aquifers and actually enforce their regulations. That would surely solve the problem, right? Well, no. There's also a significant economic disincentive for water companies to provide proper access to running water to the city's poorest residents. They usually live in small villages, or what's known as kampungs. Here, water is supplied through a public hydrant for the entire community to share. 
But under this pricing structure, lower income customers pay less per unit of water piped to their homes than higher income customers, and providing a public hydrant for a kampung results in more revenue for water companies than providing piped water to each resident. So poorer residents can't get the piped water they need and turn to extracting their own. It's a kind of vicious cycle. Other ideas put forward include a plan to drill infiltration wells that are designed to allow rainwater runoff and flood water to naturally drain back into the aquifers. Another idea is to replenish the lost floodplains and green spaces in the city. Like the sponge cities we're seeing across China, these natural methods can help mitigate floods. Instead, the government has opted for this, a colossal $40 billion seawall that looks like it's straight out of the future. Another thing that's straight out of the future is opera. Now, I use this all the time, and it's perfect for researching big stories or topics like this week's video. Don't know if you're like me, but I'm someone who seemingly likes to have thousands of tabs open at any one time to keep track of all the different things I'm trying to do. But unlike other browsers, where those tabs and windows could easily spill into an unorganised chaos that would rival Jakarta's water system, Opera keeps all my stuff together in one place. When I'm looking up Indonesia's rich history as well as its sci-fi future, the split screen feature is perfect. I can have two tabs open within one browser window at the same time. All I need to do is drag one tab downwards and my screen splits into two. Tab traces also lets me easily see my recently visited tabs which are underscored here. The darker the outline, the more recently the tab was visited. Now, personally, I love this feature because honestly, I love not having to click through my open tabs to work out where I just came from. And when you've got a lot going on in a story like there is in this one, Tab Island enables me to group my tabs together based on context. These can then be collapsed to save space and expanded again when needed. It also has this cool floating music player where I can control my music while working on the script for this week's video. And I can even use it outside my browser, which is music to my ears. And if I need help with anything at all, Opera's built-in AI tool, Aria, can answer any questions in the command line. I just use a quick shortcut and ask away. Aria can even generate images from a single prompt, and if I upload an image, I can get more information about it. If all of that isn't enough for you, then check this out. There are different color themes you can choose from for when you're getting sick of the same old thing or looking to procrastinate for a little bit. There are loads of dynamic ones to choose from, including this calming blue. Opera's been a game changer for making these videos, but don't just take my word for it. Check them out down there at the link below. It is completely free to use. Don't forget guys, when you do go and check out our video sponsors, it massively helps me and the B1M team to continue making great videos for you. So please do click that link below. Now let's get back to Jakarta while it's still there. This glitzy plan for a wall and artificial islands is in the shape of a Garuda, the mythical bird that is a symbol for the country. It aims to be a barrier against tidal surges and sea level rises, supposedly safeguarding the city's coastal areas. The new islands are going to include massive new developments and housing complexes to try and alleviate Jakarta's urban density, at least according to the government. Interestingly enough, this 40 km long, 20 meter high wall harks back to Jakarta's Dutch past. It's being designed by a company in Rotterdam. Now, the wall is going to be constructed in stages, the first step of which is to strengthen the existing dikes along the coast. Once that's complete by 2030, the dikes are going to be extended into a giant seawall that will extend out across the bay. By 2050, the seawall will then be closed off completely and become a reservoir. This reservoir will store rainwater and hopefully provide the city with enough drinking water so that groundwater extraction is no longer necessary. They're also going to integrate floodgate systems into the design to control the amount of water coming from Jakarta's 13 rivers and prevent overflow. The whole thing's going to be mostly built by land reclamation, something the Dutch have plenty of experience with. Almost 90 years ago, the country constructed a seawall of a similar length, the 32km Oslo Dyke here by the Wadden Sea. That project was one of the largest engineering feats of its time and is credited with saving large parts of the country from catastrophic flooding in 1953. When it was constructed in 1927, ships would dredge material and deposit it directly onto the sea floor until it breached the surface. Basalt rocks were used to strengthen the dike and it was raised to its final height with sand and clay before being topped with grass to hold the surface material together. On the 28th of May 1932, the final gap in the dike was filled, finally separating the Netherlands from the Wadden Sea and creating one of Europe's largest lakes in the process. 
Today, fairly similar materials are used in land reclamation, although now we use concrete to reinforce the dikes, as well as those other materials like sand, gravel and clay. Now, the Jakarta seawall is going to have to be especially strong to hold the new developments above it, like potential new skyscrapers. It all sounds pretty astounding, at least from an engineering perspective, but experts have warned that the seawall would disrupt marine ecosystems, alter sea currents and lead to the erosion of nearby islands. Even worse, the wall could trap polluted water from Jakarta's rivers, turning the enclosed bay into a stagnant and toxic lagoon. It's not exactly an ideal situation. The project's been further criticised for displacing coastal communities, particularly fishing villages, without proper compensation or relocation plans, something which has only fuelled the sense of economic inequality and marginalisation of the city's more vulnerable people. And to top it all off, there's been substantial criticism of the project's overall viability. Besides its enormous price tag, this thing is going to take 40 years to construct, which is not exactly a quick fix. By that time, potentially 95% of North Jakarta could be below sea level. The wall's financing relies heavily on land reclamation and private investment, leading to fears that it prioritises commercial interests over public welfare. Allegations of corruption haven't exactly helped concerns either. Critics argue that the seawall addresses the symptoms rather than the causes of Jakarta's flooding problems. It does nothing to stop the excessive groundwater extraction that's actually making the city sink. But while the wall is still in the early stages of construction, Indonesia's new capital has been charging ahead. The city is called New Sinatra and it's located here miles and miles away from Jakarta, in the middle of the jungle. Now, this isn't an entirely new concept. Countries have built new capital cities from scratch before. Brazil has Brasilia, Australia has Canberra, Egypt is moving its government offices out of Cairo. But fleeing a sinking city might be a new one. Construction of New Sinatra began in 2022, with the project estimated to cost around $35 billion. The development is structured in five phases, aiming for completion by 2045, coinciding with Indonesia's centennial of independence. The city has all the splashy hallmarks of a contemporary development. It's designed to be a smart and green urban centre, with renewable energy sources and extensive green spaces. Recent footage shows the Garuda-shaped presidential palace and new highways connecting the city to other regions. This government really does like that bird. But surprise, surprise, this project has again faced criticism for a number of reasons. The construction site encroaches on heavily forested areas, including nature reserves home to endangered species like orangutans. And the new presidential palace looks quite a lot like the Palace of Versailles. Local indigenous groups, such as the Balak people, have been displaced to make way for the city, and many fear the loss of ancestral lands and cultural heritage. The project has also struggled to attract foreign investments. Initial investors like SoftBank have withdrawn, leading to reliance on state funds and raising concerns about its financial sustainability. Despite the progress, massive delays remain a reality. The presidential palace is nearing completion, but the airport and other essential bits of infrastructure are all still waiting to be finished. The story of the sinking city is a parable we often come back to. From Atlantis to Galiga Mesh, we use these myths as lessons to teach ourselves about greed and hubris. In the case of Jakarta, the sinking city is all too real. But perhaps rather than a flashy mega project, the solution is actually far more down to earth. Giving vulnerable people proper access to running water might work a lot better than a palace in the jungle. Don't forget to check out the link for my video sponsor, Opera, below. When you do go and check out the links from our video sponsors, it massively helps me and the B1M team. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you're subscribed to the B1M.